I thought what I would do for this episode is kind of share with you some of the lessons I've learned when it comes to being a dungeon master. Um, when I when I did my video for getting started with role playing, that's kind of one of the most common emails I get in response is they go, "Well, that's good, but um, you know, uh, who's gonna run it? You know, how do I how do I do a game that?" Um, it's kind of like the the death clock campaign, the one you saw me do on a stream. Um, there, there's there comes a point when you move beyond published modules, and the uh, the the campaign kind of takes on a more organic life of its own, where it goes beyond a, a script in a book. You know, you're, you're reading right out of a book, and becomes something more, where the where the players are really dictating what's happening in the story. And um, I used to really turn my nose up at published modules. Uh, I don't anymore. There's, there's a reason for that. It's because um, when you're starting a new group, oftentimes if you're starting them with strangers, you don't know their style, you don't know what kind of characters they're playing, and you, and you don't know the, the, the group dynamic. You don't know how they're going to fit together and how they act. So I, I actually really like uh, published adventures for the first adventure for a group. It, it, it does provide a good setup. If you can find a good adventure, it gets them started. And you can lay the groundwork for, for an ongoing campaign. Uh, what do I mean by groundwork? Well, there, there has to be uh, a, a connection between adventures. It's, it's not much of a game, in my opinion, when they just go from published module to published module. They're in one city one day, and then when they finish that adventure, they just they leap to the next adventure in some other city, some other country they're not familiar with. It's disconcerting. There's no continuity there, and that's that's really the key. Is is continuity where the players feel like they're deciding what they're going to do instead of just whatever book the DM breaks out. And it, it is a little bit disconcerting for a player to know that the the DM is reading out of a book because all of a sudden it means they're constrained. Like uh, like the DM will slap them down if they try to depart from the established module and to an extent that's actually pretty true it's why it's why i used to turn my nose up at published modules is because there is that that lack of leeway you know if if it says we're going to the tomb of horrors and they don't want to go to the tomb of horrors well you might as well go home so um part of the key is making the players want to do something that you you know you want them to do without them necessarily feel like they've been railroaded into doing it and so there's there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, I, I I think my, the main thing I start with is I force you got to force the players to role play, and to do that, you that that's what alignment is in a lot of ways. It's it's a tool to uh, give players a reason to act a certain way. So if your character is lawful good, well he's you know when when a situation presents itself, he is prone to act in a good way or you know he's prone to act in a selfish way if he's not good something like that that's i think really the the primary intention of alignment is to just kind of spur role playing and it snowballed but um some players are kind of uncomfortable with the concept of getting into character they might think it's silly or or they they're just awkward around strangers and it, 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 it's it's really encapsulated i've spoken about this before where players start referring to each other just by class names. Thief, go pick that lock. Or Elf, go identify that magic item. Because they don't have an identity beyond the pointy ears. Or they don't have an identity beyond what they do. So that was always very frustrating. Because I, I would play a wizard a lot. I would play a, a thief a lot. And they would always go, Thief, go pick the lock. And that's partly their fault for not taking an interest in your character. And it's partly mine for not having... Um, for not having a character to remember. So part of it is actually having a memorable name. Something that's not something that's not annoying to say, something that's not like uh you know part of it is like uh if I I've seen this a lot of times when somebody's playing a drow or it's it's actually usually an elf. Um who they pick a really they pick a really long uh consonative name with a lot of syllables that's impossible to remember. So when you make a really annoying name that's impossible to remember and say, you know, it takes eight seconds to say, you know, my name is Sinarola Nariven of House Sim Riven. You know, they're, they're not going to call you that. They're going to call you Elf. They're going to call you Drow. You know, um, part of it is having a fun name. 
uh, or at least encouraging your characters to come up with a name or a nickname that people can call you. Um, and that actually, that it, it, you, you laugh about it, and it seems like a, it seems like a silly thing, but um, it really does help build a group rapport when there's a name they can call somebody, or a pet name, or something like that, that they can refer to each other uh, just on the spur of the moment, and, and kind of develop, like, inside jokes and stuff like that. For instance, um, I played, uh, I played a, a, a paladin named uh, Sir Jeremy Mallar, and... His thing was, I actually, I, I came up with this myself. I wrote the Duck Knight. His, his, he's called the Duck Knight because his name is Mallar. And when people make fun of him for being a, a Boy Scout, they call him Mallard. So the Duck Knight. So they'd call him Ducky, Duck Boy, stuff like that. And so that was his thing where his friends would call him Ducky or some variation of that. And, you know, it actually does spur a lot of innovation because now you start to you, you start to wonder, does does Sir Jeremy have a problem with this? You know, it, of course he does when somebody who doesn't know him calls him like in an insulting fashion. But when a friend calls him that. So you've got this thing where like he might take offense at somebody else calling him that. But when his friends call him that, well, it's, it's fun. It's 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 uh, it's camaraderie. Stuff like that. So Tandem the Spoonie, you know, the, the name Spoonie was really funny. I don't even know what it meant, um, but it was just, you know, instead of calling him Bard, which they used to call the character, you know, hey, Bard, go sing something. They'd go, hey, Spoonie, go do this. And I'd be like, okay. So it, it, the name, when you encourage your players to get, you know, descriptive or memorable names, it builds that group dynamic. And I, I know that sounds silly, but it when you start to build that friendship, um, you actually do start to cut down. They, they stop becoming a series of alignments. They stop becoming a series of classes and actually like obstacles to overcome and to argue with. Um, you know, you, you cut down on the whole the dwarf hates the elf thing that happens in every party. And you give them a reason to, to be friends, you know. So you actually manage to cut down on the prisoner dilemma or, or you know, possible conflicting loyalties or alignments when they're friends, which is actually, um, somebody asked me, is it possible to have a party where there's a paladin and an assassin, somebody who's evil, in the same group? Yes, it is. It's not easy. And, and, and I'm, I'm, it's going to cause an argument, no doubt, on the board. But the thing is, um, you know, there's a lot of circumstances where, like movies, the, that's the whole idea of the buddy cop movie or the buddy film is where you have two diametrically opposite guys and it's not necessarily because of alignment, but they're they're complete opposites. But they get along, you know. They're friends. So um, a paladin is always, uh, you know, you keep going back to the paladin as being the stuck up. He's he's always the tough nut to crack because he's really not going to put up with a guy murdering other people right in front of him. But uh, that's it, it's kind of how it starts. Is you have these guys be friends kind of despite themselves. Um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent on that one. It's not a good example, but. Um, Part of the trick to building a campaign that's bigger than the books is group camaraderie. The other thing you can do is give them a reason to be adventuring. Um, force when, when, a, when a group gets together, you have to really give the players, tell them, when you make your character, I want you to come up with, this is what I always do, come up with a goal, a long-term goal for your character. And, you know, I run out of the... There's a there's a book I have called Central Casting, which rolls up backgrounds, and oftentimes that comes up with the goal. But you can just ask a player, um, you know, outside of, outside of what we're currently doing, what does your player want to do with his life? You know, um, and, and it can be almost anything. You can be vague about it, but it has to be something. It, it can't just be, my character left home to seek his fortune as an adventurer. It sucks. It, it it has no character to it, you know. It, it there's it's it's basically a, a responsibility free character that, you know, once the the character ceases to exist when, when the adventure's over, he does. You know, what does he do when there's no dungeons to go into? Does he have a job? Does he have any interests? He has to have something. Perfect example of this, um, Inigo Montoya. He has pretty much the prototypical uh, overarching story goal of, of, a, of a player character. He wants to find the guy who killed his father. And you know what? For a character in a D&D game, that's fine. As long as it's something. 
to give each character something that they want to do, a reason to quest, a reason to travel and adventure and look for something. You know, something just over money. You know, money is an okay reason to do something, but there has to be, what is he going to do with the money? Is he going to buy a castle? Is he going to, is he going to, you know, become a lord? Or does he want to become king by his own hand? Does he want to hire someone else? Or, you know, does, does he want to hire an assassin to kill? Or you wanna, you, does he want to pay a spy to track somebody else down? Who? Why? Um, so just becoming rich, you know, seeking your fortune, not a good reason. What do you want to do? Um, having a long-term goal is key for every single character. And it, it's remarkable how few characters actually come up with that. Even something as simple as, I want to find the guy who killed my father. I want to find the guy who, who took my father's sword, destroyed my village. Something like that. you got to have something. And it, it's, it doesn't have to be hard. Um, and you can really work with your DM to come up with a reason, because the DM's always looking for a hook to, to get the players involved in something. Um, some reason to throw in some weird cryptic clue. And again, that's where the background book comes in handy is um, you can come up with like a, with a keepsake or a memento or some weird artifact or some strange memory that the character has. So like, you know, the six-fingered man. That's brilliant in terms of D&D storytelling because all the, let's just take this, let's say Inigo Montoya is a player character. All of a sudden this player has something memorable to go around looking for. It's it's oddly specific, but hard to find. So everywhere, you know, Inigo Montoya goes, his first order of business, the, the player, when he goes to a town, is he's going to say, I go to a tavern, and I'm going to ask around if people have seen the Six-Fingered Man. Um, and, you know, it, the, the player, the party's going to be interested. Why? What Six-Fingered Man? What the hell? You know, or they, they'll, they, you, you can have a, you can have a monster they interrogate, drop a clue and say he saw a Six-Fingered Man. And all of a sudden the player, you know, the guy playing an ego is like, what? We got to track this down. Like, and they're like, why? Well, we, we got to like, you know, and all of a sudden you have a dramatic arc where the character can choose to reveal details about himself or not. Um, but, you know, is very dead set on completing this responsibility, maybe even going so far as to violate his alignment, but having a good reason to do so, because that's his goal. It's the one thing he wants to do. Um, it, it really, that really, I think more than anything, that's what builds a campaign, is giving each character something final that they're building for, and that can change. You know, over the, you can have the, over the course of the adventure, the guy playing an ego finds a six-fingered man, and and, and gets his revenge, and then you have to ask the character, well, what now? He wants to be the Dread Pirate Roberts. Okay, that's the next goal, you know? And so, the, the, whenever, he, whenever, whenever he takes a job, or whatever he wants to do, it's always in his mind that he's going to use this information, or he's always using this as an angle to find the thing, or become king by his own hand, or find his mother, you know, maybe he doesn't know who his parents are, or he wants to find the secret to a key he was given since birth, or, um, you know, he was, he was given a sword, or some kind of a keepsake as a child, his inheritance was some weird sword, and he wants to find out what it does, because it's a normal sword, but, you know, he senses power in it, or something, you know, um, or he believes that he is a displaced king from a distant land, or the foreign heir, or, or he, he witnessed a treason in some city, and he needs to find some way to get evidence to bring the conspirators to light. You know, um, there's all sorts of long-term mysteries that you can come up with for a player, and the DM will be so happy that you came up with this shit, because... Like, you know, let's, like, you know, uh, his wife was murdered, and all he found on her body was uh, a, a precious sapphire pin in the shape of a mockingbird on her, on her, on her shirt or something like that, and that it, it wasn't hers, and he has to find out where this, so he can show this thing around, it's worth, it's worth hundreds, it's worth thousands, but he, he's not selling it, he's not giving it up, because he has to find out who this belongs to, and so all of a sudden you've got this character with this really priceless artifact, but you know, on the condition he can never sell it because he needs it to find out. So you've got this, you've, you've got these character motivations that, that don't involve, you know, the module, but, um, you can, you can, you can extrapolate that in, into a longer term campaign. And from there it just builds, you know, you can, you can decide that, you know, maybe you, you, you take these published modules I got here and, 
you know, maybe in the big, you know, in the villain's desk or on his on his body, he has a scroll tube or something like that that actually has a clue to one of these characters, uh, you know, secret goals or secrets. Or you can even decide in some way that many of these characters' goals intertwine. Like maybe they're all looking for the same thing. Like the guy with the magic sword, it belongs to the the slain king, and you know the the assassin who killed the king killed the guy's wife, and it all ties together and stuff like that. So. Once you've got those goals, you can you can network them together and, and you can really build a personal story with these with these guys and um they can do research between between adventures. They have an excuse to go pursuing leads they would otherwise not have an interest in pursuing. Um, you know, it gives the ranger a reason to choose his favorite enemy. Like, why would your character choose spiders? as his favorite enemy. Uh, well, because the drow, he saw a drow slaughter his village. You know, something like that. Um, it, it, it gives so many answers to to why a character does what he does. and Why did he become a paladin? Why did he become a cleric? Why did he choose to take up a strange class that's not, you know, like why would why would a dwarf become a wizard? You know, which is kind of an unusual choice, despite what several books would say. You know, why would this character change class all of a sudden or, or do something that's not standard? This is why. Um, why would a character choose a... Uh, why would he wield this strange weapon that was passed down to him when that's not his normal... You know, stuff like that. So, and, and you can integrate that into into character motivations in the modules. You can integrate that into treasure halls. You know, uh, treasure uh, stockpiles that are in, the, in there. And you can use that to, to link one adventure to another. Maybe one clue leads to a different module and you can point them that way. It works out great. Another stumbling block for a lot of DMs is that they're they're really afraid of being caught uh, in a plot hole or an inconsistency or what often happens is um, sometimes the players are way more immersed in the campaign setting, especially if it's a published campaign setting, than the DM is. Um, to the point where players would often correct um, setting details, which is actually very annoying. Um, or... or uh, or point out inconsistencies that that really do catch you in basically a lie. Like, let's say you completely fuck up and you're like, oh shit, yeah, I forgot that. Um, or they just outsmart you and they manage to completely circumvent the the adventure you had kind of planned out as, as a stroke of genius. Um, so th th part of it is there's always a risk of... Uh, being caught, you know, and then what do you do? Because then you, you know, people are afraid the game's going to fall apart. They're going to lose respect for me. Um, you know, they caught me in a, in a plot hole and I don't know what to do. Um, there, there's a lot of problems associated with that because um, it, it kind of dispels the illusion. And so um, what you do in that event, and this actually comes up a lot. Um, you, you know, I've lost count of the number of times when um, when when players point out something inconsistent in in something I've said in the game. Like, that's not what you said before, or that's out of character for these guys because historically they wouldn't do this, or the last guys we faced wouldn't do this. You know, so, I, I, it's hard to come up with an example right now. Um, but when you're caught in an inconsistency or just a logical fallacy, um, part of what you want to do is not get defensive. Like, don't argue. Because then you're arguing, and then everyone gets upset, everyone's angry, um, you know, potentially gets angry, or you, you start to get argumentative, and you don't want to do that. Um, because then it seems like you're defensive, and they're poking holes in your campaign, and then they are, and then you're freaking out, and then you start to get maybe vindictive, and you don't, you, you don't want to go that road. What you, what you don't want to do is argue. Either admit that you made a mistake... You know, like say, yeah, you're right, you know what, let's, let's back up a bit and just do this, and there's actually no harm in that. It may seem like a big step where I go, oh, fuck, yeah, you're right, that guy, you know, that guy who who did this wouldn't be able to use a certain item. I, like I said, hard to come up with an example, but, you know, if, if you've DM'd, you know what I mean, where you've, you've got this, uh, you, they point out a plot hole. You can actually just go, yeah, you know what, you're right, um, I fucked up, so let's back up and I can fix this, and, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a retcon, it's blatant, um... To a degree, but it's it's better that you that you just compliment them on on spotting the problem, and say you know what you get you you got me I mean I, I you're right you know what 
kudos to you, man. You screwed up. You know, would you mind if we backed up and do this? And sometimes you can't do that because something, you know, something was at stake. Something, somebody might have died. Uh, you know, a character might have died, or something really important might have been going on. But that's it's it's not as big a deal as you might think to just kind of mea culpa and and just kind of rewind a little bit. It's you know it's it's embarrassing, but they'll have a laugh as long as you don't get angry about it. That's the thing is, there's no point in getting angry. What's better to do is if they've caught you in a boldface lie or they've just pointed out the biggest fucking plot hole in the world, like uh, just. How, you know, how did the vampire hide this here? He would have had to be out in the daylight to, to hide this here. You know, something, you know, something like that. Um, if they've just pointed out something fundamentally wrong with something you just said, agree with them. And just be mysterious about it. You know. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, um... Let's say they let's say they pursue uh, they pursue a creature into a into a dark cave, and the the creature gets away down the down the down a maze, and they're like, well, how did the creature how did the creature get away from us? The creature doesn't have dark vision; it can't see in the dark, and it didn't bring a light source down here. How the fuck did it get away from us? You know, we can see in the dark. How did it how did it outpace us? Or like you know. This is a short creature. How is it outrunning us? We have a we have a higher top speed than than this creature. Agree with them. Be like, yeah, you're right. Weird, isn't it? You know. So, it, like I said, like I said, I'm not coming up with good examples here. But if they've caught you in a plot hole, go, yeah, that does seem weird, doesn't it? And just kind of smile mysteriously. Agree with them and say, yeah, you know what? That doesn't make sense. Don't explain it. Just nod and go deep oh shit they caught me and just like yep that's right and so then they start wondering if you did it on purpose you know like fuck maybe it wasn't what we thought it was if it can see in the dark what could it be it's moving faster than it should how what what, what could this you know then they start thinking you're really then they start thinking you're really on top of your game, like you're pulling a fast one on them, like you're like you're tricking them somehow, and you make them nervous that way. You actually you'd be surprised how nervous you can make somebody. Like, um, like God, I wish I could come up with a good example, but you know, um, but when when you start when you just start being cryptic, and just you know when when they think they've caught you, and you just go, huh, yeah, weird. You can't explain it. You know, the, the characters all of a sudden get really nervous, like, oh, shit. You think he's got something on us now. Uh-oh. You'd be surprised how well that works. Um, just don't argue. Just go, yeah, weird. You know, um, you would be amazed how well that works. So that is, that, really, that's the, that's the big key, I think, is, is long-term goals... And just remaining mysterious. Um, you've got to remember sometimes that you, you have to step away from the rules a little bit um, when, it, when it comes to telling a story. Never say, like, um, and this is in a lot of DMGs nowadays, but, like, if they say, um, I look into the dark cave and I, I want to see if there's anything there, I roll perception. And they roll a really good perception. You don't say, there's nothing there. You say, you don't see anything there. Or you don't think you see anything there, because then you're not giving a definite answer. There's nothing there. You say, you don't think you see anything there, and you'd be surprised, again, how much of an undermining effect on a party's confidence that has. Uh, you know, that they rolled really well, and then you say, you don't see anything there. Does that imply there is something there? No, what implies is there might still be something there, you just didn't see it. Or what really rattles players is um, when the thief searches for traps, you always say this, no matter what they roll. You don't detect any traps. You don't say, there's no traps. I've seen so many DMs do that, where they roll an 18 and they go, no, there's no traps. Well, then they whip the fucker open. And you go... Because it, it, it really works on the borderline rolls. Like if they roll a 12 and they go, okay, that comes out to a 15. And I go, you don't find any traps. Uh-oh. You know, that really starts to raise some suspicions that it really shakes their confidence. And you'd be surprised how, mu how much more 
out of their comfort zone it takes a it takes a party how much more cautious they are when you start to give them you have to tell them the story from their perception not in terms of absolutes um you, you don't don't tell them they walk into a room and they see a group of orcs. Uh, they might know what an orc is. You know, that may be a bad example, but, like, let's say they find uh, carrion crawlers or mind flayers, something the character might not have um, easy access to, you know, something they wouldn't be able to readily identify. Uh, you know, even wyverns or, or uh, you know, mythical creatures and like that, something weird. You, and, or like a ghost or a specter or a ghoul or a ghast or something like that. Something that, you know, an undead creature, you don't say it's just, you walk in the room and see eight ghasts and two ghouls. All of a sudden you've quantified it. You know, all of a sudden you've given them a definite entry in a, in a, in a manual they can go look up and they know what it is and how they can beat it. Um, you know, you, you, you identify them as slavering, stench-ridden creatures their skin crawling with maggots, their teeth yellowed and sharpened to horrible, jagged points. You don't call them ghasts. You can call them ghasts later, or if they make an intelligence check to identify them, like knowledge dungeoneering and stuff like that, to identify what they are. But you don't, you never describe them in terms of absolute nouns. You always give you always have to give a description on what they see, what they smell, what they hear. Um, if you just label it, you you kind of break the illusion. You know, you have to. You're telling a story here. You always have to remember that where. Um, if you read a book, they don't just say, you know, so-and-so character walks in, saw eight orcs, he killed them. You know, you have to, you have to dramatically flare it up a little bit. Now, that's not to say you go overboard with it. You know, you don't do that every time. If they see the same thing in every room, you don't have to go overboard with the slavering jaws and, you know, dripping maws and shit like that. But, you know, you, you have to be descriptive about it. And from there, they w when you start to describe things that, that they don't know what they are, they can speculate. You know, they can speculate in character as to what's going on. They act like it's much more dangerous than it might be. Um, you know, if you describe these things that smell like fucking death, you know, these things, they, they like you say, like, as soon as you get within 10 feet of this creature, a pungent smell overwhelms you and threatens to nauseate. You think you're going to throw up. All of a sudden, the character, if he's a good player will act that way. Like, you know, he'll cover his mouth and be like, oh, I can't, oh, I don't want to get near this thing because it might actually have an effect that makes them nauseous or, or, or something like that, where, you know, if you give them a reason to role play a certain way, they might actually decide they're afraid of these creatures, that they don't want to touch these things. They might, you know, use the words disease-ridden, um, covered, with, covered with lice and parasites and shit like that. All of a sudden, they won't want to wrestle these things. You know, they, they won't want to get this shit on their good weapons and good armor, you know. Um, if they're crawling in a sewer and they're facing carrion crawlers, you always got to reinforce the shit they are wading through. You got to be descriptive about this kind of thing so they can act like it's there. You don't just go, you, you can't be uh, clinical and say you pass through a 10 foot by 10 foot, well, you know, you, you go into a 20 by 20 foot room. The walls are made of hewn stone. It is cold. You know, you got to you gotta be descriptive about this. And if that means typing up ahead of time, um, you know, entries of, of what the rooms are like when you do that, do that. You I mean, it, it really does pay dividends when you describe this shit. Um, and that's why, that's why published adventures, especially for beginning DMs, are so handy is because they do that. They describe every room you walk into. And it works out fine. Um, what else when it comes to, to, good, to good DMing? Um, really what I would always do is... Uh, another thing that, that I, I've always found very handy was memorable villains. Um, and that, that's always a tough line to walk. Uh, is, it's, it's very hard to uh, have a long-term villain in a D&D game. Because... Uh, players are always very good about being uncinematic about this kind of thing, where, like, if the, if the villain is at their mercy, they'll probably just kill him, you know? Um, and for good reason. I'm not saying they're stupid for doing that, but having a recurring villain is always very difficult, and it's one of those elusive goals that a DM wants to do, is have this guy kind of plague the players over and over and over again. Um, it's very hard to have that kind of untouchable guy, because... 
uh, either the either he's not really untouchable and they'll try to kill him no matter what, or they'll get themselves into a no-win scenario trying to kill this guy uh, to the point where, you know, you always have to have some kind of out where the character has a teleport ring and he just fucking leaves, which is, you know, honestly one of the better ways to do it. Um, just have a teleport ring and he gets away or, or uh, you know, he throws his minions ahead of them. And But you have to have something that's just, like, completely foolproof where, you know, he... Uh, he goes into it, you know, he leaves his minions to fight the players off, and he, like, first round, he's gone. He's through a secret door, and he bars the fucker, and there's no way through. Of course, then there's always the player who blitzes through the entire line, and he's like, I try to shoulder the secret door open, and then he rolls a 20, and he blows the door open, and you're fucked, and, you know. But, you know, if they get the roll, they get the roll, and so that's, sometimes you gotta be flexible when it comes to that kind of thing, but, um, recurring villains are always good, and again, that's where the, um, that's where the the goals come into play where if you want a recurring villain you have to have it be that guy that they're looking for the six-fingered man and the, you know it comes to be very it, it comes to it, it just tends to flow naturally when you make it clear that this villain is kind of untouchable until the climactic event that uh you know he's gonna get away or or he's he's always one step ahead but uh it's when it comes to when it comes to the good villains um it it it's it's often in, in in your best interest to make that villain basically a coward. Um, I've always found that you know you, you you always people a lot of times make the villain just like this big badass dark knight, who you know he's just got a lot of hit points. He carries a big sword and he's he's grim and mysterious. I've often found the cowardly villains work the best, where they're you know they're like Prince Humperdinck, you know the kind of chicken shit character who. He's evil because he's born into privilege and he's, you know, he's very safely protected behind high stone walls and hundreds of guards. You know, he really is untouchable, but he's such a pompous dick. You know, um, the kind of guy who, when it's even close to being a fair fight, he's booking it. You know, he's he's throwing his guards, he's throwing everyone he can in front of him, sacrificing everybody, and he can get away with it because he's in charge and he can get away, you know, so... And just when you get the guy nailed, when you get the guy nailed down and he's dead to rights, oh shit, he's got a fucking teleport ring, because of course he would. You know, he's fucking rich, that's the first thing he probably bought the motherfucker, you know. So, you know, when it comes to having villains like that, it really works out well um, to have, but it, it, it's always very tricky. Um, what a DM can't do is get too attached to the recurring villains, because if the, if the players got him, they got him. Um, you gotta let him go sometimes, where, like, if the, if he's on a horse and they're shooting after him on their bows, and they roll really well, and they're just gonna, they're gonna fuck the guy up, you know, it's just like, okay, you got him, yeah. Um, but again, it's always very tricky. Uh, what I would always do is, if they got him, like, let's say they got the guy, and they just, you know, they got a lucky crit, and he's down, I go, well, yeah, you investigate his body, and it's not him. It looks like him, but it's clearly, you know, like, you maybe, you know, he's got five fingers, and they're like, what? And, you know, they feel robbed, like you fucking robbed them, but then you go, well, it was an imposter, or it was a doppelganger, or it was a body double the guy had hired, you know, something like that. Um, so you can do this. You can come up with really chicken shit characters to do that, but it, it, that's, that's, that's a big part of it, is, is tying those villains, or the villain of the module, in some way into your character's backstory. It starts with the party, such that if you... Um, if you can tell a story that's unique to the party, it moves beyond the modules, which never involve these characters. Actually, uh, I keep talking about Pathfinder. Um, Pathfinder is another is a game that, in, in a lot of ways, does try to involve. They they have what's called um, talents. I think it is. Um, talents are oftentimes uh, campaign specific to give them a reason to be involved in the campaign. They just, they're they not just sitting in a tavern one day and some guy hires them, which is like the ultimate cliched beginning to a game. This actually gives them a reason. Like, maybe they lived in the area and they have a, you know, they've, been, they've been sent by their father to go investigate such and such. You know, It actually gives them a springboard into the campaign. It gives them justification to be there. Um, that's That really is, to me, the ultimate to what you want to do. Is um, and so you'll notice if uh, not to toot my own horn too much, but you'll notice that that's what happened in in Death Clock, uh, the the campaign I ran on Skype, where all of the players really got invested in each other and their own past. Examples: you had a guy with a really fun name. You had uh, you had uh, Angry Joe who had Lord Commander Vane because. 
You know, he wanted to be this guy who considered himself nobility. You know, he he might not have been, but he he calls himself Lord Commander Van. He dresses like a fucking field general in some army, and nobody knows what he fuck he's. And he's got you know his name is Lord Vane, so of course he's going to be very he he's very officious and very you know I won't say pompous, but he's very. He's very high on himself. He thinks he's a lord. He might be a lord, but he acts like one. He acts like a fucking dick. But, you know, he's a uh, he's he's very powerful and he's very brave and very courageous and damn it, he carries himself like a noble. So that was his thing. And so his big thing was he felt like, you know, he was an honorable lord and he should be, uh, you know, he should be given the respect and attention due a lord. You know, he fought by a code of chivalry. You know, when when he challenges somebody to a fight, it's one on one. It's mano y mano. You know, it's it's you know we're fighting like men here. So he had this code of honor that he kind of came up with himself. He had a long term goal. He was going to retake his homeland because you know his homeland was take was was destroyed and he was going to restore it to its former glory. That was his goal. Skitch. Um, Skitch originally didn't have a long term goal, not per se. Um, but his character Garrett was a bard, and so what happened to him was early on in the campaign, they basically fought. Uh, they basically fought a god that was. Um, it was. It was a very. They, they were. They were like first, second level, and they're like, how would they fight a god? Well, it was a very weak form of the god because the god had been in hibernation for centuries, right? And so basically, the god was was very, 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 very weak. And only had like a projection of itself into the realm, and so they they basically fought an aspect of this god called the Scorpion Queen, and what happened was, um, Skitch essentially got very unlucky, I believe, and got critically hit, which would have killed him. But instead of killing him outright, I decided that the Scorpion Queen, kind of somehow infected him with her tail and infected him with like a with with her with her venom, you know, that gave him the curse of the Scorpion Queen. That, you know, it, it, it gave him this curse. All of a sudden he had this weird cursed blood inside him that was this long-term storyline of his where all of a sudden he was seeing strange things. He was hearing strange voices in his head. He could all of a sudden hear the Scorpion Queen's voice in his head and felt like maybe her influence was corrupting his soul. And all of a sudden he had this, he had this uh, goal to get rid of this curse. You know, he, he all of a sudden... You know, he was becoming the vessel for the return of the Scorpion Queen because it had inject he she had injected her essence into him. So it was this very weird story, but all of a sudden it was very personal to him. You know, because you know he had to get rid of this shit. And uh, Sean's character, Darstein, there was this magic book that carried the essence of another, a, a basically a, a famous arch, you know, an arch wizard that had escaped the wrath of this, escaped this cataclysm by storing this uh, essence inside uh, a, a magical tome. And so by reading the tome, he also was cursed, and every day pages would he, would vanish from the tome, and the implication was that it was, it was uh, disappearing from the book and appearing in his head. So all of a sudden he was getting this knowledge of magic spells and arcane rituals slowly taking over his mind, so he had to find a way to free himself from this curse and get rid of the book before it overrode his mind, and he became this other person. Um, I'm trying to think of other characters uh, that, that that had a personal stake in this, like um, Lord Cat's character wanted to had a very personal vendetta against elves and gnomes and basically hated everybody. But you know, there there was all sorts of things that really that drove the characters onward. Like when you make it a personal thing, that you know, all of a sudden the character has something. Um, they can't easily just go to a temple and cure or a reason to keep going, a reason to not stop, you know, to keep traveling, looking for answers, looking for, uh, looking for a scroll to cure them or some answers, looking for, looking for, uh, you know, rituals and looking for historical knowledge on this ancient forgotten God or a way to free themselves of this arch lich's power. You know, all of a sudden you've got this, you've got them by the balls and you can lead them anywhere they want, but it's their idea unless they want to die, you know, so you've, you've got this great thing where uh, you, you can put them on the plot railroad just so long as you're not making it clear, like, you're doing it because I say so. You know, they you, you tell them, like, let's just say Skitch wants to find, he's like, uh, well, I, I've got this curse, what does this mean? You know, like, I, I feel like I got, this, I got this horrible infected scar on my chest, and I'm seeing things. And I go, well, 
uh, you don't know. And so he asked the cleric, what do I do? And so the cleric goes, uh, rolls knowledge religion, and he goes, um, well, I, I don't know myself. This is an ancient god, long forgotten, but maybe. And then so the DM starts filtering information, saying like, well, maybe the the ancient library in this city might know if you went there and looked it up. All of a sudden, they've got this quest, and they're going. You know, So all of a sudden, they've got a reason to make a cross-country journey to this city, and the rest of the party's going because they're friends, or at least you know there's the there's the promise of of knowledge or spells, or you know we can we might find something on the way to to do there. And sure enough, you can have quests on the way, and so they've got reason to go there. And so they find a book on the Scorpion Queen, you know, ancient ritual knowledge, and they they find that you know if you're if you're infected with the venom of the Scorpion Queen, you have you have two years before it overwrites the soul completely, and the only way to get rid of it is a sacrifice of something, or a ritual, or you have to summon the thing and do this. And so you can sprinkle these clues and steps to get rid of something without make, with it, it, it seems like a process of discovery. It doesn't seem like I'm forcing you to go here. Um, you can also give them options, you know. If they, You can also give them, like, you can either do this one way or you can take the harder way but doesn't involve killing innocent people. And so they give them a moral quandary, stuff like that. Anyway, I'm rambling on about a lot of, a lot of ways to... That's, that's how you get away from the books. I still use the books a lot, but the main reason I use the, pre, the, the modules is because I use the maps. I, I like to, you know, the, a, lot of these, a lot of these modules have good dungeons that are drawn. I can't draw for shit. Um, I just mainly pillage the maps and rewrite the, you know, rewrite the encounters inside them to involve, you know, the same building, same dungeons. You can do that. Just give them a different context to be there. Like if there's a, if there's some kind of castle or a palace in one of these, you can make that the library they have to infiltrate. Maybe there's no visitors welcome. They have to sneak in or like some wizard's tower. They have to go and steal the knowledge from there. And so, you know, that's, that's how you get away from the books is, you you give them a reason. You make them the guys who have the initiative to go do something. When you do that, you'll find that you don't really need to be that great of an improviser to tell the story. Um, because you'll have time to think about it. If the guy says, if the guy comes to you and says, I got this idea. My character has amnesia. You know, he, he woke up and he has some weird scar on his face. He doesn't know how he got it, but he knows, he, he remembers a flash of something like anger and blood and he's, a, and something, you know, something like that. You all, you can come up with shit. You can, you can do this. You can tie it into one of these. Um, you can tie it in with another characters. Um, when a character's like, and this stuff happens, like the, the idea with Skitch, I didn't plan that, you know, um, I, I didn't plan, but it was like, instead of killing him, I could have killed him because the damage was enough to kill him. But I was like, instead of doing that, why not make it something special? Where, you know, you can ask, I, you know, I asked him. I was like, I, you know, in private, I was like, this pretty much wasted, you got unlucky, this pretty much wasted you. Now you can do this, or we can keep your character alive and I can give you this idea where you're alive, but you're cursed. And he's, you know, Skitch, he's like, I love it. I, you know, it gives me a, it gives me something to do. You know, it gives me something. You know, all of a sudden, my happy-go-lucky bard character, he's got some kind of tortured soul now. He, you know, he's he's got this problem, and he's got a reason to to go on or you know uh, to to spend money on something, a reason to research magic. You know, something some some bigger purpose, and that's really what it's all about. So it, it can either happen in character creation or it can happen organically. Um, every pretty much one thing I do is and some some dms might consider this cruel but uh if a character drops below zero hit points or is killed um you don't necessarily need to kill them but one of the rules i always have is, the, is if they go below zero hit points they have something uh some lasting impact there's either just like a, a you know some people have tables for this like a lasting injury or a scar or they you know if they're if they're stabbed in the stabbed in the chest they might have a they might not necessarily take a dip to constitution, but they might have a, a long-term lasting cough or a raspy voice as a result of that. Like if they got slashed across the throat, they might have a raspy voice or a scar across the face. Or, you know, you don't have to make it a, an in-game effect unless you want to. Um, you know, and, and you can argue that with the players. I think what I did with Skitch was actually I, uh, I, I said that this, you know, there's a cost. 
if you want to survive this, because they can't raise you at this point. I was like, if you want to survive this, you're cursed. And you're also, uh, I, I forget what it was. Like, um, I think I think I said he was uh, more susceptible to poisons because his constitution was weakened from the curse. And he was like, okay, okay, so I gotta be more careful, right? I'm like, yeah, you gotta be careful. And you've also got this really ugly fucking scar. And there were more impacts as the curse went on. There was really scary side effects that started to happen to him. And that when you do that, you you build up a sense of dread. Um, you build up a sense that things are bigger than them and they have to work harder to to achieve success. Um, and that's where you really start getting into uncertainty. You know, when, when you start building up uncertainty, the game becomes much more exciting. They're much more cautious. Uh, it, 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 I'm sure it's, it's, I'm, it's easier said than done when it comes to telling that kind of story, like, well, how do I do that? Well, that's, that's where it starts, is, is giving those characters a reason to, to keep going and actually not giving them a lot of hope at first, because if you give them, like, a time limit or some kind of nebulous thing, like, uh, let's say they go to the book and they say, the curse will strike when the, when the, uh, when the moon's aligned and the moon turns red as blood. And they go, what does that mean? And so, you know, all of a sudden they, they talk to the wizard, you know, the, the wizard of the party, and I go, well, knowledge arcana, maybe you can figure it out. And they go, well, I don't know, but if somebody who's, you know, a wise astrologer might know when that is, so just to know when the time limit's up, you know. So then all of you, you know, you start building up these events, you start building up these, these fantastic places, like, well, of course, they have to go to this, they have to go to this ancient library, well, where would this ancient library be? It would be in this huge city or maybe an abandoned capital of a fallen empire or something like that. You know, you can build these fantastic locations. Um, you know, who would be guarding this place? Uh, would some ancient, like, would a dragon be guarding this place? Or would some ancient wizard jealous of guarding his knowledge be guarding it? I don't, you know, there you go. You start at, you know, you start asking these questions or the players, you know, what, what's, what's great is players will oftentimes solve these problems for you. That's why I say never say no to the player. Not, not, not never say no, but, you know, when the players say something, agree. That could be, you know, well, if there's a, you know, they, you know if, if I say you have to go to the ancient library of Og, they go, ancient library of Og? Oh, that sounds like it'd be heavily guarded. And you go, yeah, doesn't it? It sounds like, uh, you know, it just sounds like the kind of place that, yeah, you can't get in there without, you know, without invitation. And all of a sudden they start giving you ideas, you know, like what could be guarding there, where this place could be. And, um, it, like, they can give you ideas and things just, they build. Just, just shut up when you're a DM and listen. And they, you know, they can be their own worst enemy sometimes because they'll give, they'll be, they'll be, sh you know, just shotgunning ideas out there of, you know, plans and stuff like that. And don't use it against them. Don't be like, I know what you're planning, so I'm going to stop you from doing that. Reward them for good planning. What I'm saying is, you know, um, oftentimes they can be the inspiration for a great game. Because, you know, that's, that's where the improvisation comes from, is what you can do is... Let's say let's say Skitch gets cursed, and I go, well, okay, you've got this, you've got this curse, and um, just rem if you don't know what it does, like I didn't know what it what it did at first. I was like, you know what, you've just you you've got this horrible scar. Your your eyes are subtly changing color. You're hearing strange voices and and, and stuff. And I, I didn't even know what the, I didn't know what the final implications of this were. Um, I was just making shit up. Um, I wasn't being cruel to the guy and I didn't make it big at first. You had to have, you got to have it escalate. So, you know, after that adventure was done, I started to think about it. I was like, well, how would this grow? What, how can I use this to build up a sense of dread or a sense of paranoia in this guy? Like maybe he can sense things that the other players don't like. Maybe it's a strength actually, because he actually started to do this where he could actually use this to sense, um, undead. He could use this to sense, uh, demonic spirits that were around. So he could basically sense evil using his own curse. So it, it, it became a tool, but it was something he didn't want to tap into for fear it would take him over. You see what's happening here? Because like, he's got this gift, but it's a dark gift, you know. Um, he's afraid, he doesn't know what it is. It's not something that's codified in the rules. So he he's uncertain as to what it is. You know, he's asking me and I'm like, you don't know. You have to ask somebody who would know, and he's like, "Well, who's that? You have to go here." Um, when they don't know what you know, it's it's a fear of the unknown that makes characters a lot more skittish about this type of stuff, and it makes them really more invested into finding out into into un, un, to unlocking the mysteries of your game. 
um, I think I'm going over the same ground a lot here, but it, it really is important to to reinforce over and over and over again that you want to get the players curious about what's going on more so than just a dungeon crawl. Um, I know a lot of a lot of games start off as dungeon crawls. That you know, I've seen players go through the the epic dungeon like this huge fucking box set of just floor after floor. Um, one of my favorite box sets is the Ruins of Undermountain, which is nothing but a huge fucking dungeon crawl, and I use it. But what I don't do is I don't just run a pure dungeon crawl where they kick open a door, they kill the monsters, they get the shit. That, you know, and there's nothing. You know, honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. It really is the D and D equivalent of playing Diablo. And that is a valid form of gaming. I'm not saying that's a weak type of gaming, but it's not a lot of role-playing. It's it's combat. And that's valid, but it's not the kind of game I favor. I favor telling a story. So when you come up with uh, a role-playing game and a campaign, I always tell a story as if it were a movie I would be happy seeing. Easier said than done. You know what I mean? But... You know, oftentimes there's nothing wrong with indulging in cliché as long as you... It, it, it has to evolve at some point. Like, you know, like I said, the, you know, the king... The player's goal being king by his own hand or finding his father's murder. That's as cliché as it gets. But you can do stuff with it. You can make the villain unique. You can make, you know, you can make the quest for finding him unique. Like, maybe the weapon was something he's never seen before, like a bullet wound. And, you know, that's a, this is a weapon this guy's never seen. Like, where, there's some kind of, like, smoking hole in this person. That there's a lead shot. And I've never seen this before. So, but maybe there's a, there's a realm somewhere else that actually uses firearms. And they have to quest there and go, you know. So you can, you can do things with this. Um, you know, maybe the player's goal is to become king by his own hand. But that does mean overthrowing the current king. So you've got, you've got difficulties there. But it gives them initiative to go forth and do stuff. And I love the dungeon crawls because I, I pillage them for maps. So, um, yeah, cliche is fine. Um, it, you move on from it, and it, it, it's really not hard. Um, it, 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 there's nothing wrong with, with playing the stereotypical elf wizard, you know, or playing the halfling thief. In fact, most of the games reward you for doing that because, they, I mean, that's a reason they're stereotype. There's a reason they're cliche is because they're really good at what they do. Um, I often go against type. Um, you know, I, I often do a halfling fighter, which you laugh at. They're like, oh, please, a halfling fighter. But what if you had a really burly fucking halfling who, you know, he's sick of the short jokes. He's going to fucking kick your ass. Um it's, it's unconventional. It works. And so if you call the guy shorty, he's going to break your fucking kneecaps, you know, um, or you could have, uh, you could have an, a half orc wizard. I had a half orc thief for a long time, um, where, you know, they, they made fun of him. Um, this, this, this I, I probably told this story before, but like, you know, um, his name was Edwin and he was a, you know, my guy, my half orc thief had a 17 strength. He was this big, burly, 280 pound motherfucker, six foot six, tusks out to here, the most unstealthy bastard you ever seen in your life. And so, you know, uh, I believe the party met him at a thieves' guild. So I often don't like when parties refer to a thief as the thief, because they oftentimes have no idea the character is a thief. So I'm like, as far as you know, I'm just a fighter like you, but as soon as you start disarming traps, but whatever. So. They they ask me out of character. They go you kind of kind of half in character, half out of character. What do you do? And my guy goes, "I'm a thief," and they laughed. You know, the wizard he starts laughing at me. He's like, "You, you really?" And I go, "Yeah." Why does that surprise you? And the the wizard goes, "You know, pardon me. I just don't see you exactly sneaking up and picking pockets." And I go, "Really?" And the guy goes. You're like six foot six. How are you going to steal anyone's money, you know, coin purse? I take my club, whack him on the head, and I go, when he wakes up, tell him I stole his money, and I walked off. You know, I didn't really hurt him, you know, in terms of care. It was just a, it was just a funny character moment where the guy, you know, the wizard guy played along. He was like, you know what? You got me. That was pretty good. So, I, yeah, I'll slump down, knocked out. Uh, you know, I and I gave him his money back. I didn't really steal his money, but I answered his question, you know. I was like, how, how are you a thief? Well, I'm not that kind of thief. You know, I'm a th I'm a thug, 
Uh, my guy, you know, he's not he's not that sneaky kind of thief. He'll fucking brain you over the head and he'll take your money. Um, he's still very good at, you know, climbing walls. He's very athletic. He can he can backstab. You know, he's got a fucking sword. He, sword out to here he can backstab you with. He just doesn't sneak that well. <laughs> you know, the guy weighs 280 pounds. He's not sneaking anywhere. But he's a good shot. He's a strong sword hand and he can stab you. He can fucking shank you when he wants to. He's that kind of thief, baby. Um, so... You know, play against type. If you're a player, that's how you can help uh, be a character. You can play either with type or against type. You just, just as long as you're clear, you know, as, as, as to what you do. And you don't just make yourself Bob the Human Fighter. It's so boring. That's why, you know, for me, characters always start with the name. And it's... it's People, you know, you should agonize with the name. Never, ever just sell out and go, I, I don't know, his name is fucking Bob. Don't do that. Come up with a name that's interesting, that's re that's memorable, um, something you can make a nickname out of, something that's endearing, um, something they can remember, and something they can call you, something, you know, something easy to remember, something that's not, unless you want it to be pompous or really hard to remember, but that has to build into your character what you, what your guy is like and and honestly if you've ever read the uh, a game of thrones um george r r martin does a brilliant job of doing this because oftentimes the characters have a family name and they tend to indulge in the stereotypes of the family name like you know the the lannisters are rich they're silver-tongued they're treacherous sons of bitches but Almost, in fact, I would almost wager virtually every major character in that series has a nickname. The Mountain That Rides, The Hound, The Viper, The Imp, uh, The Kingslayer, you know, Ned Stark, something like that. That's, his name is Eddard, but his, they, his friends call him Ned, stuff like that. Uh, Lord Snow, they, you know, he's, he's, you know, the bastard son of a lord, so they call him jokingly Lord Snow. It gets to, it gets to him. He, it pisses him off. He didn't like to be called that. So, if you can come up with a name that's either endearing or insulting to that person, uh, the halfling fighter I once played, um, the DM, uh, and I came up with a fake swear word that, uh, if you ever saw Willow, they all called him Peck, uh, you know, as, as a, as a derogatory term for his height. Well, uh, in this game, they called him Petch. So what his deal was, was that uh, a race of hobgoblins, and this is not the hobgoblins in terms of mystery science theater, hobgoblins are basically like a really militarized, very intelligent force of orcs, basically. Um, the hobgoblins enslaved his village long ago. So my halfling was actually a barbarian um, because he had no formal education. He was, he was basically on the wheel of pain like Conan, but he was a halfling. And I know that sounds funny, but this guy was not a laughing matter, but nobody took him seriously. And there in the game, people were very racist against halflings and, and elves. You know, it was, it was almost like the Witcher in terms of like, ev like everyone kind of had this little racist bent to them. And so everyone called him Petch. And so that was his name was he had a name, but his nickname in quotation marks was Petch. So, you know, whenever somebody hated him, they'd call him Petch. Now, anyway, that was, that was something memorable, and it, it built rapport. Because all the characters in this game were kind of outcasts. And, they, you know, you can actually get, when you get that kind of group rapport, the group actually starts thinking of stuff like, we should come up with a name for ourselves. And they start to come up with a, with a standard or a banner. That's when you know you've really got a party locked in. And encourage that kind of behavior. When they start to become really good friends, or at least if not friends, they respect each other. And that's another thing where, um, uh, you know, we, we had a character, um, they didn't like, my character was a drow, Azad, and another character was a wood elf. And by their very nature, every, you know, every other type of elf hates drow elves. So we, all, we immediately had this animosity towards each other and we had to build off that where we didn't like each other at all and we didn't trust each other at all, but we had to find a way to make it work. And so that's the key is when you have characters that have, a, that have reason to, con to conflict or even fight outright, Come up with a reason with that player why they wouldn't do that. 
Like, they might chafe at each other, they might snip back and forth, but don't ever have it escalate. You want to find a reason for these guys to finally get along. Or if not get along, have a grudging respect for each other. And so that was what the thing was with Azad, was my character, through through bravery and through his intelligence, grudgingly earned the Wood Elf's respect, if not friendship. And so they, they, you know, they had this great dynamic where all of a sudden, you know, the Wood Elf was being very surly and actually didn't, didn't respect the other characters as much as he 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 kind of hated to admit it, but Azad's a smart motherfucker. Wouldn't trust him as far as I could kick him, but when it comes to finding plans to get into that secret stronghold, Azad's the guy I'd ask. So when you find reasons, you know, encourage that kind of behavior. And and I I know I'm going over and over this point again and again, but it really is that important because it's the biggest thing to telling a story is the group tells the story for you. The DM fills in the blanks. Between sessions, you should have, once you've left this, once you've left this module, you should have an idea of where they're going. They're going to the library. Fill in the blanks. That's next week as they go to the library. Once they've accomplished that goal, where else are they gonna go? They're gonna go here. They're gonna find this villain here or, you know, um, such and such. So, that is uh, the long and short of how you should be a good DM. I know that's somewhat egotistical because it implies I'm a good DM. I think I am, even though I haven't run a game in a long time. But uh, if you want to know how I, run a ge- how I run a game, that's how it works. And it really is encouraging role-playing. If you don't have players that are keen on role-playing, um, well, that's where my expertise ends. If they're not comfortable with the group or you've got... Um, conflicting personalities, which often happens. It happens, you know, seriously, oftentimes I'm the conflicting personality. I'm ashamed to admit that, where oftentimes I tend to be a very domineering personality. I'm a control freak. I don't think I'm a very good player because part of me always wants to kind of dominate the conversation and wants to be in charge. Um, and so I get irritated with people very easily, and you've seen it. Um, so that's why it's it's why I'm good as a DM, I think, is because I get to tell the story. I set the rules. But never get defensive. Um, never get uh, never get the feeling that you're antagonistic against the group. Um, your role as a DM should be, you should be fair. And I know that's it's, it's cliche to say that, but you should be. Um, it, secretly, you want the players to win. You do. You don't want it to be easy. That's the trick. Um, that's why sometimes when you see, if you've ever seen me play a game, I'll get frustrated when the encounter is too easy. I don't want them to die. I really don't. I just don't. I want it to be a challenge because I want them to feel like they overcame something. I want them. To, I want them to feel a sense of accomplishment. So I feel a sense of accomplishment that they did. Right. So if they feel like they're just breezing through my adventure, well. You know, I, I don't, I, and, and so you don't want them to feel like you're letting up on them, and you don't want, you don't want them to feel like you're, you're just beating them into the dirt. You don't want that. You want them to feel like they're, they are balanced and challenged, just uneasy enough to where they think this could be the one, you know, this could be the fight where I die. Um, they don't want to feel like they should breeze through this, and they don't want to feel like th- we, there's no way we can win. There's that uncertainty, and that's really key. So I'm gonna wrap this uh, wrap this up. Um, if you have questions, I can always make a video on, on more games that I've done. But uh, until next time, it was uh, it was great telling you these stories. I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs>